Welcome to Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions. I'm Trevor Bechtel, facilitator of this series with Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan and instructor of the course that accompanies this lecture series. Over the next four weeks, we will introduce key issues regarding the causes and consequences of poverty in this virtual space, featuring experts in policy and practice from across the nation. We are an audience of students enrolled in a course, community members, academics, policymakers, and interested people from Southeast Michigan and beyond. And we are really excited about today's presentation from Terry Friedlein, presented in partnership with the Center on Finance, Law and Policy. Before we dig into this conversation, I want to remind our viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions and comments in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag UMPovertySolutions. We look forward to a meaningful conversation and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We welcome an open and respectful dialogue and we want to let folks know that we will be responsive to any inappropriate content. I invite you to check out our resources, tune in for additional events and find other ways to connect with our poverty research at our website, poverty.umich.edu. Terry Friedline is Associate Professor of Social Work and Faculty Director at the Center on Assets, Education and Inclusion at the University of Michigan. She is a faculty affiliate at five other university centers focused on financial system reform and racial disparities. And she is the author of Mapping Financial Opportunity at New America and the author of the book that we are gonna talk about today, Banking on a Revolution with Oxford University Press. Terry is a faculty expert with us at Poverty Solution, and through that work brought us into partnership with Bank Black USA. We've been augmenting their capacity with teams of students over the past two years, and it's some of the most rewarding work that I've done. And so I wanna thank you, Terry, uh, for that. I also count you as a friend, and I'm continually impressed by the scope and depth of your knowledge and your passion for justice and inclusion but also the calm and patient way that you engage others and put yourself forward, willing to contribute at every level. So I'd like to welcome you to this lecture series and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. I mean, it's really an honor to be a part of the speaker series. Um, it's a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, and this is really a tremendous set um, of speakers across the semester for the series. And so those joining today, I hope you're also able to check out the other presenters as part of this, this series um, who are really doing some tremendous work. Uh, I feel fortunate to be able to talk with you today about technology, financial technology in particular, um, the expansion of a surveillance state um, and the implications for racial and, and climate justice in the context of banking and finance. Um, as Trevor mentioned, this talk is based on my book, um, which was released last year. And so I'm going to begin and kind of flow through my talk um, in kind of a similar ordering um, of the book, which begins with kind of an origin story about banks. Um, because our financial system, like the United States, is, is rooted in histories of white racial violence. And one of the earliest periods of this violence is genocide of indigenous peoples. Um, Laylee Long Soldier has a poem that's titled 38 and it tells the story of the Dakota 38. Um, the Dakota 38 were 38 men who were mass executed by hanging under the orders of, of President Lincoln in 1862. Um, and they were executed in retaliation for what's known as the Sioux Uprising. Um, soldier's poem tells this, tells this history. Um, so after the Dakota's people's land were stolen, um, white settlers were moving west. They were forcing indigenous peoples off of their, off of their lands and their territory. Um, and, and so as people were being forced away from their food sources, they were starving. Um, there was a white trader named Andrew Merrick who had a trading post, provided, you know, food and other services. Um, but he refused to lend uh, lend credit, extend credit to the to the Dakota for purchasing food, um, and has this this saying that he's well known for um, that if they are hungry, let them eat grass. 
Well, of, of course, people who are starved cannot live. Um, the Dakota peoples fought back. Um, white settlers and traders were killed, including Merrick. And so uh, in response to this uprising, Lincoln ordered this mass execution, which happened just after the Christian holiday of Christmas on December 26th in 1862. Um, and it is notable that a few days later, uh, this is when Lincoln also signed the Emancipation Proclamation, um, declaring that um, enslaved people should be freed. And so another period of this violence was slavery and, and banks were established during slavery um, to finance this economic system, this, this economic system of capitalism. Um, racial capitalism is our economic system that, that stratifies economic value kind of based on socially constructed hierarchies. Who is worthy of responsible banking? Um, it's fundamentally an economic system that concentrates power. Uh, and there is much more, there's much greater depth um, and theoretical work on racial capitalism. So uh, this is a, a brief explainer, but um, a great bit of work from Black political thought has you know, really expanded, developed and expanded our understandings of what racial capitalism is. But this is kind of the backdrop um, to our conversation um, because uh, early banks, white owned banks um, in teamwork with white slaveholders uh, collateralized the bodies of black peoples who were enslaved onto the credit, onto the ledgers of the financial system, um, which was a precise way that, that white people accumulated wealth and economic power um, during the period, the very long period of slavery. Um, so, so white slaveholders um, kept detailed records. Um, they surveilled uh, the black peoples that they had enslaved and then, then used that um, in the financial system um, as capital. And so one of the earliest banks in the United States was the Bank of North America. Um, it was proposed by a white slave trader named Robert Morris and established in 1781 in Philadelphia. And this was occurring at the peak of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, Morris wanted the bank to expand the country's military power and repay revolutionary war debts. And so early banks literally underwrote slavery and they financed militarization. Um, there are two uh, quotes that I often think of in, in thinking of this history. Um, one is by Angela Glover Blackwell, a founder in residence at PolicyLink, who writes that banks are the underwriters of American racism. And um, Andra, Alexander Goodwin of the Action Center on Race and the Economy, who writes that police are the muscle of capitalism. And so Morris specifically envisioned the Bank of North America for these purposes. Now, I mentioned that this was an origin story. Um, and the Bank of North America is known today as well as Fargo. So um, I want to recognize one that there is a um, you know there's a current campaign calling for the dismantling of Wells Fargo in particular, um, but also that many of our banks and insurance companies have similar histories and similar origin stories um, being stood up and established during the period of slavery. And so these are histories of of white supremacy and racism and specifically anti-black racism that are you know, grounded, rooted, you know, very well stitched into the financial system from their very origins. Um, banks are part of the institutions are, that are the gears that make our financial system turn. And so these are gears that have financed redlining and segregation. Um, they've relied on credit scoring, um, which uh, advantages, you know, advantages of whiteness and values at a higher kind of economic rate. Uh, white borrowers um, to amass wealth by receiving better interest rates loans um, while disadvantaging black and brown borrowers um, with, with lower credit scores. Um, and banks kind of set the terms so that they, so that they win either way. So um, even in the presence, you know, even when someone qualifies for a better loan, um, banks and lenders um, still, you know, in a racialized way, um, determine who's worthy of responsible banking in a way that disadvantages black and brown borrowers and, and advantages whites. Um, and so one kind of example of this is, is the racial wealth gap between the gaps between white 
and black and brown are here, Latino or Latine households. Um, in the United States, the median wealth of white households is, is 41 times that of the median wealth of, of black households. And so these divides are widening, they're not getting smaller. Um, they're widening in part because our financial system, its institutions and the policy ecosystems around them are really designed to prioritize and, and to monetarily value whiteness. And so part of what I argue in the book um, and, and why I want to begin with this history is that fintech is another iteration. Um, fintech being this combination of technology and finance that um, will not save kind of the existing brokenness, the existing system um, that, is, that is rather broken. Um, so fintech is this broad set of technologies um, that supports and enables banking and financial services. And it really includes a range of things, um, online and mobile banking, um, to payment systems, to cryptocurrencies, and the use of artificial intelligence. Um, and it operates on individual and institutional levels. So what I mean by that is, you know, fintech can be people facing, such as someone using a, a mobile banking app um, or, um, you know, a payment app to transfer money to, to peers or to pay for something at the store. Um, it, there's also fintech that is like institution facing or institution focused, um, like hedge funds using investment algorithms. And, uh, and so there are these people facing kind of fintech services or products and institutional ones. And, and I want us to think about like blurring those lines a bit and, and seeing how they operate um, in, uh, in support of one another. Um, because I think enthusiasm for fintech, which often is great, um, you know, a, a high level of enthusiasm really lacks a critical analysis of how power is concent concentrated that is disconnected um, from the historical understandings of anti-Blackness that's that's stitched into the fabric of the financial system. And, and this, I think, vastly underestimates the, the potential for fintech to exacerbate harms, harms that will, you know, affect everyone, um, but that will be disproportionately paid for by Black and Brown peoples uh, within, our, within our economy. And so I began the book because um, in so many spaces where I was working, um, which were predominantly white policy spaces, there wasn't any critical analysis of fintech. There was a great bit of enthusiasm, but you know, no one um, or very few people being willing to put on the brakes um, or consider you know, some of the potential downsides of fintech. Um, so there was no concern, for example, about people who didn't have internet access, um, which was believed to be a small and unimportant group of people, um, or nor were they considering information about data extraction, about the concentration of wealth and corporate power, or hyper surveillance of, of racially marginalized groups. And so I, I want to elevate some of these critical analyses of fintech, um, especially in spaces where they're absent. Uh, and this is because fintech is often marketed as a way to promote financial inclusion, um, kind of from a, a benevolent um, and, and good way to serve marginalized groups. Um, and it's often not just marketed as another way or another option, um, but specifically to advertise its, its benevolence. Um, Stuart Levy, who's the CEO of Facebook's DM project, uh, which, which is a project is ongoing, um, said the company was developing their cryptocurrency to promote financial inclusion. Uh, you know, specifically talking about expanding access to those who need it most. Um, and so Facebook is the same company that is, uh, you know, criticized for being a monopoly, um, for violating antitrust laws, for selling users data, um, incapable of removing hate speech from its platforms, um, for discriminating in its online advertising, and also for, for beginning to use its messaging system as a debt collection service, um, which which is kind of a new iteration of the of the development of that of that platform, and so by moving kind of full throttle toward fintech for financial inclusion for for um, expanding access to financial services, I think we can abandon responsibility for what are you know 
really deeply rooted social problems, you know, inadvertently abandon this responsibility and, and turn them over to technologies that really are mostly being developed in white wealthy spaces and by white engineers um, that might not be thinking at all about racial justice or equity or, or anti-racism and, and just might be thinking about a very narrow part, a very people facing part of the financial system rather than its connections to the whole. Um, so, so one point of critique is that um, with regard to high-speed internet access, um, that, that this is really a prerequisite for using any type of fintech. Um, we know this a little bit better now um, at this point in the pandemic, but not everyone has high-speed internet access. Um, even smartphones have to be connected to the internet and, and you can lose your connection to your money when your phone breaks or you need a software update or you use up all of your monthly data. Um, bank branch, banks are closing their branches around the country and this really raises the stakes on internet and smartphones uh, as people have fewer like physical access points for banking. Um, and there's no way that, that FinTech can solve financial inclusion uh, when, when people who are exploited by banks and lenders also do not have internet access. Um, so these data are a few years old, but they haven't changed very much in that time frame. Um, in the average zip code across the United States, only about 50% of homes had have had high-speed internet access, um, which means just from that standpoint, um, it will be difficult uh, to really um, address um, some of the exclusion problems in terms of who has access to banking um, if you know, those same folks also might not have access to internet. Um, but, you know, part of my investigation into this work is that uh, there are a number of scholars who have been concerned about technologies for a long time. Um, so as I was trying to understand the, the corporate capitalist business practices that, that we have come to shorthand as the digital divides, um, I learned about research around data extraction and um, discriminatory algorithms and hyper surveillance um, from the works of folks like uh, Ruha Benjamin and Chris Gilliard, Twana Petty, Sophia Noble, um, Tamara Knopper, uh, and really um, an excellent group of scholars um, who are studying how new technologies surveil racially marginalized groups who are already targets of surveillance in multiple contexts like policing and housing and education. Um, so some of this surveillance should ring similar to the history of, of white surveillance and slavery. Um, Chris Gilliard has used the term digital redlining to kind of describe some of these practices that are happening in, in educational contexts, um, how, how students are being surveilled in, in education and university settings. And the Washington Post did a really great profile on Dr. Gilliard a few weeks ago. And this is the center image in the slide, which is why I want to um, point it to you now. Um, there's also work by Tressie McMillan Cottom and others on platform capitalism and how you know black women use sophisticated, use technologies in sophisticated ways to kind of navigate um, institutionalized oppressions that might be experienced, such, such as by going in person to a bank branch. Um, but, you know, from this, I've learned that, like, not only are we confronted with digital divides and disparate Internet access, um, but but fintech is also enabling kind of new digital forms of redlining and expanding surveillance um, that will be used in more punishing ways toward racially marginalized groups. So an example of this is a few years ago, um, Bank of America was um, asking some customers, you know, about their citizenship status when they came in to do banking. Um, and, and in those conversations with bankers, that's information that gets put into the financial system and to someone's you know, financial record that, that stays and gets tracked over time. Uh, and I mentioned wanting to like blur the lines between um, people facing and institutional facing FinTech. And that's what I'm gonna do in an example um, that kind of illustrates um, both the limitations and I think some of the contradictions of fintech. Um, and so this example is at the nexus of climate change 
and Wall Street investors who are buying up properties and becoming landlords. And so um, in my book, this is the chapter called Corporate Landlords in the Climate Crisis, um, which seems particularly relevant um, given all that is happening around us um, related to climate. And I'm going to talk about lumber to North Carolina. Um, and so from Michigan, um, you know, we're going to move a little bit southeast. And uh, in Lumberton, North Carolina, um, there are twice as many payday lenders as there are bank branches. Um, banks are closing their branches in this area of the country. Um, broadband internet access um, is also pretty low, about 20% of households in this area. Um, in Robeson County, which surrounds Lumberton, uh, have access to, to broadband internet. And I want to talk about Lumberton because um, the city of Lumberton was de de devastated by hurricanes, um, two separate hurricanes, one in 2016 and one in 2018, um, Matthew and Florence. And both of these hurricanes brought near record amounts of, of flooding each time or record amounts of flooding. Um, and, you know, much of our, our housing development, our floodplains, our insurance policies, you know, these have all been developed based on weather disasters, you know, in the past. Um, but increasingly regions around the country like Lumberton are experiencing 500 year and 1000 year weather events every few years. Um, so our models, um, which include, um, you know, insurance companies and, and connections to the financial system, um, these are not organized for the, for the future that climate change is bringing. Um, so in 2016, Hurricane Matthew brought significant flooding, um, and there was a technical port, technical report that was issued kind of after this hurricane hit that recommended um, that the town build floodgates to close a gap that exposed uh, Lumberton to the river. There was, there was a railroad underpass, um, and, and the town was exposed to the river through this underpass. Um, and the report estimated that about 80% of this flooding would have been reduced or eliminated altogether if there had been floodgates. Um, but CSX owned the railroad tracks uh, that ran beneath the underpass and the company refused to allow anyone to build the floodgates um, and, and to begin you know, preventing for what could be a, a future hurricane or future you know, flooding and weather disaster. And so this is where I wanna tell you that 37% of Lumberton's residents are black, 13% are native, 10% are Latino, um, the remainder about 30%, 39% are white, 36% um, of the town's residents have incomes that are below the poverty line. Um, so I wanna note that there was, a very, there, was, there was a very specific kind of corporate decision um, that, uh, that was made in the context of a city that experienced dramatic flooding um, that was also disproportionately black and brown um, that therefore um, wasn't able to prevent or, or wouldn't be able to prevent any future flooding. So in 2018, Hurricane Florence was approaching. Um, the floodgates still hadn't been built. Um, the town wanted to build sandbag walls though. Um, so uh, at first CSX like repeatedly denied requests to build sandbag walls. Um, the company threatened lawsuits for anyone who has found trespassing on the tracks. Um, emergency petitions to the state's governor uh, finally were successful and through executive order, they allowed a sandbag wall to be built. But, but this approval came, you know, just when the hurricane was a few hours away. So Lumberton um, was again flooded this time by Hurricane Florence. And you can see um, in this image, um, the highway and the underpass um, and, and the flooding that uh, ensued um, two years after, you know, the town was still recovering from the devastating hurricane in 2016. And so we know that our built environment isn't random. Um, people across racial groups don't have equal, act, equal chances of experiencing you know, devastation from extreme weather. Banks that have financed redlining and segregation, um, they, and continue ongoing kind of discriminatory lending and real estate practices, 
Um, these things enable whiter and wealthier populations to buy greater distance between themselves and extreme weather. Um, and even in fact, communities that have experienced extreme weather um, and have received FEMA aid from the federal government, um, white people gain wealth um, in the midst of disaster, um, while, while black and brown peoples see their, see their average wealth or their net worth decline. Um, and so even in disaster, you know, white people are able to profit financially um, from, you know, from that experience. Um, in Lumberton in particular, um, black and brown residents were displaced from their homes at a rate that was three to six times that of white residents. And the, um, the second hurricane, remember there was already a first hurricane which had an impact on housing. And the second hurricane shrunk the housing market in Lumberton, the rental market in particular, by about 25%. And so as climate change accelerates, um, there are Wall Street investors like banks, like hedge funds, private equity firms, and university endowments um, have been buying up properties that were foreclosed, um, you know, sometimes foreclosed um, from the Great Recession about a decade ago. Um, they've been buying up these properties that have been de de damaged or devalued, so kind of buying on the cheap, um, and then, you know, turning around and renting those properties for profit. And I'm mostly focusing on the United States here, but this is really a, a global concern. And so there's a Florida-based Florida company called Timeout Communities, and Timeout Communities was buying up properties in Lumberton after the first hurricane. So the first hurricane came, um, properties were damaged, people were displaced, and, um, and timeout communities began buying up some of those properties. Um, they began opening mobile home parks or purchasing mobile home parks um, and then renting out these properties to residents that had been displaced. Timeout communities owns about 19 mobile home parks in the Lumberton area. And so residents were displaced disproportionately black and brown residents. Um, some have been displaced at this point by multiple hurricanes and sought housing then in, in what became available from timeout communities uh, that really replaced the town's affordable housing stock. So they, they um, had access to the mobile home parks owned by timeout communities. Um, but then the corporate landlord started raising rents um, and some residents saw their monthly payments triple and they saw their monthly payments triple from one month to the next. So not without much notice. Um, residents who complained received eviction notices. And then timeout communities began evicting people that had been displaced by multiple weather disasters. Um, and so as a renter, to whom do you appeal for justice when your landlord is a private equity firm or a hedge fund? Um, and, and what, if anything, can FinTech kind of offer this dynamic? Um, well, uh, from the institution, the institutional level kind of focus of fintech, um, private equity firms and hedge funds are increasingly using fintech, institution facing fintech, like investment algorithms and artificial intelligence to identify profitable investment opportunities, including foreclosed homes and apartment complexes and other kind of depressed markets. Um, so they are, uh, using um, this technology to, to scoop up additional properties. And so um, while private equity is using fintech on the one side um, to concentrate wealth and power, sometimes our responses, um, you know, focus at the individual level. So we might offer things to Lumberton residents like a financial education class or a small emergency loan. Um, or an app that is going to manage income flows and help people track their expenses. Um, as Stuart Levy suggested, uh, you know, Facebook is going to create its D DM digital currency, uh, even while at the same time, you know, some of these technologies and these processes are, are really criticized for their potentially harmful environmental impacts. So um, Bitcoin kind of extending the, um, extending the recommendations of, of Stuart Levy and the DM project. Um, thinking about digital currencies and cryptocurrencies in particular. Um, the mining of Bitcoin, which has only been around for about 10 years, already uses 20% of 
of the electricity consumption of the entire global financial system. And, and this is just Bitcoin. This is not cryptocurrencies as a whole. Um, and so Lumberton is, I think, a microcosm of what's happening around the country and what's happening around the world. Um, we're already seeing reports that Wall Street investors are, are poised to profit from our current crisis, um, our crises that have occurred during the pandemic. Um, there, where mass evictions and foreclosures are still expected. Um, as Zillow enters into the housing market in terms of buying up properties. And so as a result of a climate-induced global pandemic um, and, and then kind of limited government response, people can't pay their mortgages, banks and lenders will foreclose on homes, um, private equity can buy up these properties in bulk, and then um, create the conditions that institutionalize housing precarity you know, on a, on a really massive scale. FinTech does not change these dynamics. Um, and in fact, I would argue that institutional facing FinTech like amplifies them. Um, it, it does not shift power uh, to marginalized groups to be able to, um, you know, confront or challenge or change these dynamics. And so I think when we individualize FinTech, um, which is often, um, in, in conversations about solutions solutions to poverty, which financial education is, is often lifted up as one of those solutions. Um, when, when we individualize FinTech um, to mobile banking or to managing income flows, I think we overlook how FinTech is, is really helping to concentrate power in some of these other contexts. Um, and it may even be directly contributing to you know, really severe environmental harms. Um, and so I think um, when we sanction fintech for mobile banking, I we can also give implicit permission, I think, for all the rest. Um, and our language, even, even the common definition of fintech um, is defined as this whole set of technologies that kind of lumps all of the dynamics together um, and then perhaps proffers up, you know, a benefit to a consumer which is a, an individual kind of consumption choice. Um, and, and I think this is the sleight of hand, um, how promises for financial inclusion um, are kind of proffered up as this facade while the rest of the financial system, you know, uses FinTech to stack the deck in its favor. Um, and I realize that some of this probably sounds pretty dire at this point, um, but I do think that there is a good bit of hope that our financial system can be different. Um, and there are people and groups that, you know, all around the country and all around the world taking steps um, to shift power. Um, and so public banking, public banking movements are one of those movements that I write about in the book. Um, Native and indigenous communities have for a pretty long time called for divesting from environmentally harmful development projects. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline is, is one example, but I also want to note that there are protests, there are protests today at the U.S. Capitol um, regarding the Enbridge Line 3, which would bring a new oil pipeline um, through treaty territory from Canada to Wisconsin. Um, uh, and, and banks you know, finance, um, finance some of these pipelines and environmentally harmful products. Um, but uh, public banking movements are working together to um, remove private shareholder profit. So the, the ability you know, for white wealthy, investor, white wealthy investors to really profit um, from investments in different ways, um, like properties and like the buying up of rental properties. Uh, and so, they're working to remove a linchpin that concentrates power, um, which I think is, is really notable. Uh, so there are um, cities and states around the country, about 34 with active public banking coalitions, some with pending legislation. Um, they have been successful, especially in the state of California and in the city of Los Angeles, which has passed legislation um, that would, that would, create that allows for the creation of public banks. So, so these are real steps that are moving forward. Um, and public banking would allow for about, you know, $7 trillion um, in public money, money from pension funds, money from tax revenues um, to be invested locally. Um, so instead of having 
that money invested in a Wells Fargo and having those profits and, and interest kind of pulled out of communities, um, that that money could stay locally and be in, and be used to invest in things like affordable housing or um, new kind of green and sustainable development um, and to invest in the people that live there. Uh, this is not a panacea. Public banking isn't, isn't a panacea for everything, but I think it is an important step and it is a step that works explicitly to shift power. Um, and so, uh, so part of the hope that I have is that um, movements like these are demonstrating that our institutions aren't intractable, they aren't inevitable. Um, they can be built with more transparency, they can be built with more public accountability um, than private banks or proprietary algorithms that FinTech is based on. Um, technology is often positioned as, as this futurist thing, but I don't think it inherently is so, um, just because we see it depicted in, in sci-fi sometimes or in our own imaginations of the future. Um, I think it can exist in the future, but, but people um, collectively, we should get to decide kind of what that technology is, how it exists, uh, the purposes that it serves, and, uh, you know, the benefits to the public good. And, and we can decide that in ways that advance racial justice and equity. Um, and those decisions don't have to be driven by, by banks and by corporations. And so that's kind of the message that I want to end on um, as we kind of move here in a minute to, to questions and conversation, um, that there are efforts to shift power um, and that people-led movements with anti-racism, with justice kind of at their core, they can help us imagine that our financial and economic systems can, you know, can truly be different. Um, so I'm going to stop my sharing here um, and look forward to your conversations. Thanks so much, Terry. That was just a wonderful presentation drawing um, from so many areas uh, in a kind of really consistent um, and coherent kind of approach. So um, there's a lot, a lot for us to kind of pick up um, coming out of that. Um, I wonder if we can start. Um, I know that there's a bunch of stuff about student loan debt in your book, and we um, we are kind of at a university with with a bunch of students. So I'm so I'm wondering if you can start by just kind of talking a bit more about the um, kind of transparency and surveillance that kind of goes alongside student loan debt, if that's another kind of facet here. Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you for thank you for pointing to that work in the book. Um, part of what I write about is that um, you know there's a process that financial technologies use called securitization. Um, so, so one, I'll say that, um, you know, we as a society have, have pulled back from investing in, in higher education as a public good, right? States invest less money. Um, the burden of education is shifted onto individuals and students in the form of debt. So student loan debt, you know, is, is really increasing as a share of, of all other kinds of debt. Um, securitization is this process um, that bundles up a whole bunch of individual lines of credit. So like perhaps each of our credit cards or each of our student loan debt um, bills, those get packaged together um, that banks can then sell off to other investors. So other people end up buying that debt and they buy it in this bundle or this package. Um, and uh, and student loan debt has been something that has been historically pretty hard to have discharged in kind of bankruptcy hearings. Um, the government, especially student loans that are government backed, uh, the government guarantees, um, you know, all, uh, all, um, you know, all of that money will be paid. So if somebody defaults, you know, the government pretty much guarantees that, a, that an investor is going to, um, get that profit. And so um, I don't know if this is what you're thinking in terms of student loan debt, but um, but I mean, that creates the condition um, 
you know, especially a student loan debt is racialized. Um, and uh, which means that um, black and indigenous and Latino students in particular pay, um, have more student loan debt, pay on that student loan debt for a longer amount of time. Um, all of that gets bundled up into this process of securitization, um, which means that uh, that is that is helping to um, funnel, you know, someone else's debt, you know, transmute that um, into wealth for somebody else. Um, mm -hmm. And so not only do we have a kind of a, a problem of student loan debt, but we have a problem of this process that that turns that debt um, into into profit. And um, and fintech is a tool to help make that securitization possible. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a large, um, such a large system that you're identifying here. Um, so deep in history, but also kind of so deep in terms of kind of the new technologies that we dispose. Um, and it seems to like the, the way you detail it working its way out in all of these different, um, areas. It's just, it's just fascinating. Um, I'm going to go to a, a question from Jeff Cutler now. Um, do you see any movement towards your point of view in Washington? Um, so the House Financial Services Committee has held some critical hearings on fintech and inclusion recently. So do you, do you see, we, we, we have a lot of kind of changes in our kind of federal political scene right now. Do you, do you see these changes being positive? Ah, thank you, and, and thanks for that question, Jeff. Um, I, I think so. So um, there have been folks that have that have spoken at those committee hearings that have more critical views of fintech and that are calling for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, for example, um, to have uh, to have more oversight of of what's happening in the fintech space, not just creating a sandbox for innovation, um, but being really thoughtful about um, what data are being collected and, and how and who has control over that. So, um, although I have to say, I have been talking about um, at least internet and, and banking since 2008, and it feels like that conversation has been really slow. Um, you know, it seems like it has just now kind of bubbled to the surface. Um, so I see more momentum kind of moving forward with, with folks taking a, a, a critical view of that. When you talk about um, public banks and, and that kind of shift um, and, and the kind of hope that that can kind of be a way for people to kind of take control of these systems, um, are you... I, I, so this is partly a question of clarification. Lydia Thornburg has a question about what role you see small local banks playing in, in this financial revolution. So I'm interested in a bit in these kind of questions of scale. Um, and then there's a kind of follow on um, about the role of um, black banks or black finance, uh, black fintechs um, kind of helping in that in that context. Yeah. Um, I. I I want to try to be thoughtful about not saying that every effort is bad, right? Um, because I, uh, I think I probably lean that way, um, and also uh, know that that's not exactly true. So, so small banks, community banks, and black-owned banks, um, and other minority depository institutions um, do much better in terms of in terms of lending. Um, lending to folks at lower kind of credit score points, um, lending to black and brown borrowers at higher rates compared to their larger bank counterparts. Um, so, so smaller organizations that are really mission driven, like do better on the whole. They're also challenged in that they're still working within this larger system, um, which means that you know, they need to do things for themselves to, to survive and exist. Um, so one thing like, um, you know, moving a pension fund or moving like um, tax revenue from a city, a very large pot of money 
into these small institutions can be sustaining um, to help, you know, help them lend out um, uh, in, you know, in easier ways and instead of having a whole bunch of really small accounts um, that still have the same sort of overhead. Um, so I see that as a place that um, smaller community banks, black owned banks um, really play a role in, um, in serving communities where other banks, um, you know, wouldn't invest. I, there's still kind of a contradiction, though, because a few years ago, um, my colleague Jacob Faber and I uh, worked on research where we interviewed banks, and they were mostly small community banks, and found that, you know, overdraft fees, um, the cost of a checking account, that, that those, uh, you know, those costs um, were also kind of... Um, disparate across racial groups. So white people paid significantly less for the cost of banking, even at small community banks. So um, th I think they're simultaneously like opportunities and tensions there. You talk a lot about um, that in the kind of ways in which you talk about change uh, towards the end of your book. Um, but I want to, I want to kind of shift at this point and, and ask a kind of reflective question about about kind of the book i was i was really impressed in reading the book um by the kind of deliberate efforts that you're kind of consistently making throughout to kind of learn from other people and i found this a really kind of interesting um kind of connection between um kind of positioning yourself as a learner um using a lot of kind of quotes from a variety of scholars at the beginning of your work and working with those quotes throughout the chapters um, but also kind of very much being an expert in this area, having a kind of sense of this whole scope of information. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm just interested in reflections that you have about being a learner and an expert kind of simultaneously, um, especially in kind of spaces that work towards racial equity. Um, so. Um, this maybe is also a good point for me to say, I mean, Trevor, that you're someone that I have learned from too, kind of along the course of this. Um, Trevor is one of the people um, that I acknowledge in the book's acknowledgements section um, for um, kind of modeling that learning and expertise simultaneously. Um, one of the things uh, that I do is um, use quotes from the people who have inspired me to think about this work in different ways. Um, so, you know, the folks who are working at Black Bank USA, um, who have, uh, who I have learned a significant deal from in working together. Um, uh, black and brown women who are doing work in this area that have, um, they have shaped my thinking. And so I wanted to honor that, um, you know, in the, in the process of writing the book, um, the places where I'm learning things from, um, that, that there's knowledge that has come before me, right? That, that I am, I hope to be part of a, of a continuum, you know, um, jumping in at a particular time, but recognizing that, that there's work that's come before me and, and hopefully this will seed, you know, also work in the future. Um, most of the quotes are from black and brown women throughout the book. And so, I, um, you know, both as a white woman, you know, wanting to um, acknowledge the great work of my colleagues. Um, but as I mentioned, kind of the contradictions and tensions um, with some of the other in the context of banking. Um, Audrey Lord has this, um, she has this letter that she wrote uh, to a white woman named Mary Daly who uh, used quotes um, from the work of black women to kind of like justify her own work and, uh, and is, a, is a good and, and critical and kind of poignant letter saying, um, you've quoted us, but you haven't engaged with us at all. Um, and I think that that's a um, kind of a line that I will constantly walk and sometimes fail on and you know sometimes do okay on. And I, and I hope I've done, um, on the better side um, in the context of this book, but that's um, 
that's what it's there. That that's that's why those are there, um, and how I see myself both as a learner and and an expert. Um, I I will say, um, it is not e always easy to be an expert in banking and finance as a as a woman, um, where most of that content is uh, is produced by folks in business and economics who are men, um, and and so. Um, I also felt a, a great need to heavily cite work and kind of demonstrate a level of expertise um, to preempt the challenges that, that mm -hmm. might subsequently come. Yeah, I think, I think you do that incredibly well in the book. I, the, the kind of advertising uh, with the kind of use of these ep epitaphs to kind of start things off um, and then, and then a really the, the way that the chapter is written to kind of take us through the material, but there, there's a lot of depth in footnotes, um, which kind of lets us know there's a there's a lot that we can kind of attend to. I want to I want to step back now at this point um, and shift uh, in into a kind of more simple question um, that I think gets at gets at a, a lot of the kind of issues at the center here about about how we can kind of make. Um, make some of this more accessible. And, and this is in the form of a video question that I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up. So um, McKenna will ask this question. Hi, my name is McKenna and my question is, what are some ways to make financial technology more accessible to people and communities who may not have like very easy access to technology? Thank you. Thanks for that McKenna. McKenna. Um, I think um, one question that I often try to ask myself, um, which is a question that I think um, Maryam Kaba, who's a, who's a prison industrial complex abolitionist um, has posed um, for others to consider before is um, who's already doing work in this area and, and um, how can I learn from them or support them? Um, and I think there are a number of community efforts um, where communities are, are building their own internet systems. Um, Detroit is, is an example where this is happening. Um, there's a there's a great book, which I think it's a great book. I haven't I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it that documents um, indigenous communities in Mexico building their own um, internet systems. And so, uh, you know, I think um, looking at where people are are doing this work, um, because it is it is happening in places. Um, is a place to start to see, you know, what do people want? What kinds of technologies and fintech, you know, do people want? And when they are building it themselves, what does it look like? Uh, which is different than um, what it looks like when a, you know, when a Silicon Valley kind of tech company um, decides to create something. That's great. Um, so there's, there's a different directions that I can go in now. Um, but I think what I will, I think I'm going to choose, um, this, this question from Leonime, um, your, your book ends with a letter to the field of social work. Do you have a kind of similar message to those who are teaching, learning, or working in business FinTech space? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Liana May. Um, I um, I do think the message is is similar. So, well, maybe not so similar. So, in that uh, you know, in that chapter, which is a, a dear social work, um, which is my profession, um, I I do not. Um, always have the opportunity to connect with or to see many social workers thinking about banking and finance or, or economic development um, or monetary policy. And, and social work, even with its own kind of contradictions and, and, and problems, has a, has a mission statement and has coursework embedded into its required, you know, required curriculum around diversity and social justice and around systems thinking and around community organizing. And I don't think 
that coursework. I, I, I know that that sort of coursework doesn't exist to the same sort of, um, you know, degree requirement that something that everybody takes um, in a business class um, or in an engineering class. And so I want social work to be, you know, interested in um, and working on some of these questions, um, perhaps in collaboration with um, those who are teaching, learning, and working in the in the business fintech space. But I think my message to them would be a little bit different. Um, you know, they are forefronted oftentimes, and and at the position of making decisions and leading on those, and um, too often at the end going back um, and thinking about. You know, um, I was thinking about the iPhone version that is on number 13 or number 14 that um, just has a camera that is capable of, um, of lighting and taking, you know, better photos of black and brown and, and darker skin tones. So um, it's great that that um, exists and that should be something that exists in the first iteration, um, not the 13th one. And so, um, so I suppose my message to the business and fintech space would be to do better sooner and more quickly. So often um, studies of ethics in universities are kind of dispersed into the curriculum. And so a school will be able to say, well, yeah, we do it. We do it across our curriculum. Um, but I think you're right that social work is kind of unique in, in foregrounding a lot of that kind of work uh, in, in the curriculum. And I do think that that is something that that other kind of spaces can learn from. So thinking about that a bit more and kind of taking it into a much more, a much larger context again, um, both in terms of our national history and in terms of kind of contemporary discussions. I'm interested in what your thoughts are in terms of uh, kind of reparations programs um, that, that we have either at local or at kind of federal levels um, to kind of address some of the wealth gap that exists and, and how those connect to kind of public finance and and some of the kind of thoughts that you have about public finance. Yeah, um, I hope it is clear, at, at least um, you know, through uh, other people's kind of good work on this topic and, and through this book talk, that there are, you know, real structural reasons um, for the racial wealth disparities that exist, and and therefore I think that calls for real kind of structural responses. Um, and there haven't been. Um, reparations for American descendants of slavery um, for Black peoples um, who uh, whose families um, were enslaved through that system. And so, uh, so there's a, a real debt that uh, requires repayment. Um, and there are um, both um, kind of more like Trevor, you mentioned scale, there are kind of like local efforts um, where uh, individual groups or um, local governments are, you know, deciding that there are steps that they can take to repay harms that have been um, inflicted um, by by white people and by white leaders on um, black and brown members of their communities, or that there are disparities that they're responsible for redressing, kind of in their local contexts. Um, and I and I think one of the tensions is that, um, you know, will these local efforts kind of undermine a federal response? Um, and I think, you know, very clearly um, a federal response and a federal operations program, right, is as needed at the federal level as, as, as well, um, given that, um, and that's, that's part of the work of um, HR 40, even in, in its kind of complicatedness, um, federal legislation to um, establish a reparations commission and, and enact reparations um, and the work of Sandy Darity um, and Kirsten Mullen and, and thinking about what a federal reparations program would look like, that um, those levels of scale can happen at the same time. Right? Um, the federal government has a debt to repay and, and I think the local cities and communities that have, have done harm have debts to pay too.
Well, um, Terry, you've really enriched us with this presentation. It's been a, a, a wonderful kind of, yeah, introducing so many different things. Uh, we've been doing a bunch of work over this lecture series with kind of thinking about the role of the community and how that um, kind of, uh, how, how that interacts with governments, how communities kind of put their ideas forward. I um, mean, you've given us a bunch of new layers to think about with that. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful to you. Uh, for kind of offering us this. And I, I know that there's a lot more that we could do. Um, I've got a lot of other questions that I didn't get to um, from YouTube. Um, so I wanna thank everyone on YouTube for kind of offering such great discussion points. Um, and um, and so, uh, but I think with that, we're, we're, we're at the end of our time together today. Um, and so thanks again so much um, for, for your presentation. And I wanna just invite everyone to tune in again uh, next Friday, um, when we'll be talking to Jonathan Cohn. So thanks so thanks much. Thanks so for having me. Yeah, it's great.